everybody for joining us. We've got another one from Oxford. We've got a fair few from Oxford, which is great. That's where we're all from. Um, but also it's wonderful to see so many people joining us from all the way around the world with some really lovely goals for today. So thank you everybody for sharing. Um, so this session, this webinar is um, a webinar on enhancing your writing and your peer review by using reporting guidelines. And it's delivered by those of us from the UK Equator Center. Now, the UK Equator Center is part of the Equator Network, which is an international organization aiming to enhance the quality and transparency of health research by improving the quality of health research writing. And we do this because all of the research you do is based on existing literature. So by improving how people write about their research today, we're ensuring better quality research tomorrow. And we do this by raising awareness of these amazing tools called reporting guidelines, we host a website filled with resources on academic writing, including all of the reporting guidelines for human research and many of those for animal research, and we offer education and training. And before we start, a huge thank you to Cancer Research UK and the NIHR for funding the UK Equator Centre's programme of research and training. So in this session, we're going to talk about the purpose of a journal article, which is the thing we're using reporting guidelines for. Uh, we'll talk about what these tools called reporting guidelines are, and we'll talk about how they can be helpful both in producing your own papers and when you are reviewing other people's papers in peer review, whether formally or informally. And then we'll cover how to choose appropriate reporting guidelines for your work. And we're going to finish with a panel chat, a discussion with reporting guideline experts from the UK Equator Centre, where you can ask any question you've ever had about reporting guidelines, where they come from, how to develop them, anything like that. So I'm Jen DeBayer. I've got a background in microbiology and in academic copy editing, um, and I'll be taking the first portion of the session. And I'll be joined in the second portion of the session with by my colleagues, Gary Collins, Shona Kirtley, Patricia Lagulo, Michael, and Michael Schlissel. Um, they're all specialists in reporting guidelines, but I'll introduce them all properly later. So fantastic. Uh, let's get going. The purpose of a journal article. So I don't want to just talk at you for the better part of an hour. That'd be boring. So why do you do research? Let me know. Why do you do research? If you do research, if you don't do research, why do you think people do research? What's the purpose? So you can just type it in the chat. Catherine, I'm sorry. So to answer questions, uh, to um, fulfill scientific curiosity, yeah. Answering questions, fulfilling scientific curiosity, anything else? Any other reasons why we do research? Um, understand disease or the factors associated with the disease, lovely, yeah. Improve care, yeah. Improve people's lives, yes. Discover something new, yes. Improve humankind well-being, love it. To find out if something works, yes. Um, in medicine, aiming to improve clinical practice, love it. These are fantastic. I think we've, um, we're kind of going around the same sort of topics, which is great. So answering questions, fantastic. Thank you everybody for sharing your reasons for doing research validating findings, confirming current evidence, understanding the world. These are all wonderful, I love it. These are really great reasons for doing research. Um, and they are different reasons. People have different reasons for doing research. But when it comes down to it, I think you're all talking about a very similar thing, which is that most of us want to do something with our research. We want it to change the world in some way. We want to maybe change how other research is done or how people think about something or maybe we want public policy to change, or we want healthcare to change. We want our research to be used by somebody to do something. And in biomed, one of these big underlying reasons that a lot of you have mentioned is improve health, whether that's human health or animal health. The only, and the only way our research can do this is if it reaches the people who need the research, who can use the research to make this change. So who do you hope will use your research? Who's the list of people that you hope will use your research? We'll all have somebody different. Who's gonna use your research? Other researchers, healthcare professionals, academia, yeah. Uh, policy makers, clinicians, frontline healthcare work professionals, patients, yes. Researchers, policy makers, regulators, government, patient advocacy groups, leaders, I love all of these, fantastic. Future generation of researchers, uh, companies who've got a stake in this. Yes, pharma companies, yes. We've got loads of fantastic options here. 
Lovely. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. So yes, I think I've got a few of these. I think you've covered everything I'm going to say. So our research users, they can be way broader than we sometimes think, because sometimes we just think, oh, researchers, maybe just like us, but maybe researchers from every bit of research, laboratory to clinical trial, and from very different subfields from our own. Um, yes, pr clinical practitioners, professional practitioners who might use our work, systematic reviewers, comparing our results to other results, um, people, patients, understanding their healthcare, understanding their world, uh, professional organizations to change practice guidelines, government, public policies, all of these things. Fantastic. These are all the kinds of people who might want to use our work. And to do that, they need to understand our work. And usually, all they get from us as a researcher is a journal article. And that journal article needs to include everything that each of those users need to understand, judge, and use our work. And most of them never get a chance to have a conversation with us to clarify what exactly we did. So that journal article needs to work for all of those potential users without us as the researcher standing next to that person and clarifying. So what do users need? They need something that is easy to read, easy to understand, and has enough detail for their use. When we're writing journal articles, we've got to be thinking about our users and thinking about these three things. We want simple, clear, complete journal articles. And we're focusing on this element of completeness in this webinar. This element of completeness, does it have all the detail? And you would think, yes, of course. The problem is in human research in every clinical area studied thus far, poorly reported. The information that readers need to judge the study's validity, decide whether sensible decisions were made and combine study results together in syntheses is simply missing. So one example, there was a big review that looked at 21,000 clinical trials used in 2,000 systematic reviews. They used the proportion of items marked at unclear risk of bias as a proxy for poor reporting. So unclear means there's not enough information in the paper to decide if it's at high or low risk of bias, it's just missing. And they looked at five elements of the methods, which are all objective, yes, it's there, or no, it's not elements. So it was sequence generation, allocation concealment, participant and personnel blinding, assessor blinding, and incomplete data, outcome data. And they found that in 2011 to 2014, in that time period, we were still at over 20% of, the, of those papers were not reporting those elements. We're still that bad. We're still missing that much information. Why? Why do authors leave this information out? It's not because they leave it out on purpose. It's just tricky to keep in mind all of the elements that all of your diverse readers are going to need. When you've been working on a study for a very long time, you can forget what are the important details that other folks need to read, understand, and use your work. Those decisions maybe happened a while ago, or those decisions seemed so obvious at the time, you might not add them in. And that's where reporting guidelines can help. So I'd love to know from you, had you heard about reporting guidelines before you signed up for this webinar? Is anyone, is anyone new to reporting guidelines right here? Uh, oh, there's a no, fantastic. Uh, yes, vaguely, great. Got a yes, fantastic. Yes, so we've got a few yeses. Um, used them often, great, yes. Heard about them, but never used, fantastic. A bit, yes. Uh, difficult to implement them completely, fantastic. We'll dig into that. We've got a yes. Um, got one listed, arrive, mm -hmm. love reporting guidelines, love it to hear that. Uh, we've got a no, we've got a yes. So we've got a little bit of a mix, which is fantastic. Um, oh, we've got a helps with analysis as well as reporting, yeah. Um, haven't heard of, cool. So we've got a nice mix, which is great. So what are reporting guidelines? They are a list of the minimum items you need for someone to fully understand your study. There are reporting guidelines for lots of study designs, and most of the really big internationally accepted ones were developed by sort of big groups of experts based on evidence and often through a consensus process. They tend to be given as a checklist or as structured text that lists the information you need to pop in. And you can see on the screen the first page of CONSORT, which is the reporting guideline for clinical trials. And you can see it's just a list of information that's needed. It's got title and abstract, introduction, and then a bunch of things for methods. So it goes way beyond just the usual IMRAD structure of intro methods, results, and discussion that the journals tell you to use. So here's item four, 
It's on participants and it asks for two pieces of information, eligibility criteria and settings and location where the data were collected. And that's just one of many items under methods. So it's going into more granular detail of things that folks will need when they are using your paper. The checklist or the structured text is often accompanied, sometimes in the same paper, sometimes in a different one, with explanations of why these items are important and examples of good reporting. So on the screen, you can see the information for item one of strobe, which is for cohort cross-sectional and case control designs. It says that the study's design should be indicated with a commonly used term in the title or the abstract, and that it gives an example leukemia in um, incidents among workers in the shoe and boot manufacturing industry, a case control study. And then it tells you why this is a good idea. Readers should be able to easily identify the design that was used from the title or abstract, um, because that will help ensure correct indexing of articles in electronic databases, and it will help with search. So they tell you why it's a good idea. Um, these E and E or explanation and elaboration documents are a really valuable resource when you're working on a study design that you're less familiar with. So it's always worth having a look at those. So how do you actually use these reporting guidelines? So folks were saying, well, how do I actually implement them? Great. For those of you who have used reporting guidelines, how do you use them in your research and your writing? What stages have you used them at? Um, so we've got uh, when getting ready to write a manuscript, planning and reporting, outlining, writing the methods, study design and manuscript drafting, uh, experimental design, lab book, writing the manuscript. Uh, during the writing stage, I feel a little late in the process. Yeah, okay. Um, first draft and reviewing. Uh, before I get started, I see what items I'll have to include in my final manuscript. Lovely. Um, and with writing the protocol. So we've got a real range here folks looking at the reporting guideline all the way at the beginning when they're um, sorting out their study design and figuring out what they're going to do, then using it for outlining, using it for first drafts, and using it in reviewing. Fantastic. I think this is all of the things I'm going to mention. So it's really lovely to hear what people are doing. So let's dig into each of those for those who aren't doing this yet. So first place, planning your research study. Now, you might be thinking, but this is a reporting guideline. Why would I need to look at it when I'm planning my study. It's good to know what kind of things you're going to be asked to report once you've finished. The reporting guideline will not tell you the correct decisions to make, but it will tell you the kinds of decisions that the readers will be interested in. So it's helpful that you don't get a surprise when you come to write up. And often you'll look at the reporting guideline and say, this isn't applicable to my study, it's okay. But you've at least thought about it right at the beginning and gone, yes, for my study design, not applicable for these very good reasons. You've got that all sort, sorted through, thought through right at the beginning. The next useful spot, as a bunch of people have mentioned, is outlining. So the process of outlining. So outlining can be a really helpful step in planning any kind of paper because it breaks up the blank page and it reminds you which information you need to gather before you begin to properly write. And this outlining step is useful no matter what kind of paper you are writing. Maybe you're writing up the protocol of the study that you've just designed. Maybe you're writing up a registered report. Maybe you're writing up a stage one registered report with just the introduction and the methods, or maybe you're writing up a stage two registered report with the results and the discussion. Could be useful to outline, could be useful to use the reporting guideline here. Um, you might be writing up um, the, a, a research paper um, with results paper, but you might be doing it in such a way that your work lends yourself to planning the research paper and then populating it with the results as you work. Or maybe you work in a way where you plan the research, you do it, and then you write the paper once you have the results in hand. Any of these ways of working and any of these types of papers, outlining and therefore reporting guidelines can help. And to do this, one of the easy ways to go about it is to start with your journal's suggested main headings. It's one of the reasons it's a good idea to choose a target journal before starting to write. Um, and then use the reporting guideline to add in your subheadings or your paragraph headings, particularly in the methods and the results. And you'll see when you look at reporting guidelines, they don't say much about the intro and the discussion because those are very discursive things. They're going to be very creative writing ebits, whereas the methods and results 
there's lots to say in the reporting guideline about those elements. Once you've gone away and used that outline to write a rough draft, and you and your co-authors are editing and revising that right draft, the rough draft, it's useful to check the paper against the reporting guideline again. You don't need to keep all of those subheadings or even keep the information in the same order. You don't need to keep every subheading that you wrote in from the reporting guideline. You just need to make sure that the information mentioned actually makes it into the paper. So the reporting guideline, it's just a guide. It is not prescriptive of how you report the information or the order that it appears in. There's usually a good reason for why information appears under methods as a chunk or results as a chunk, but within those, there's a lot of flexibility. So don't worry about that. It is very helpful though, to use the reporting guideline as that framework right at the beginning, because it just helps you make sure you get all of that information in. And the last place where a reporting guideline is helpful in writing is when the journal asks you to prepare um, a completed checklist for alongside your submission. So in that case, you just grab that reporting guideline again, and you just literally run through it and write down the page number or the section number, the section name where you've addressed each item. So I'd love to hear from all of you. And so I'm gonna ask Will if he can uh, release the poll. Um, where will reporting guidelines most help you? And you can choose as many of these as you like. So this is either what you've done already or what you're now thinking, oh, I should do that. So I'm gonna give you all a moment that should pop up. If the poll doesn't pop up for you, you can just type one, two, three, four in the chat. Okay, fantastic. We've got 19 people so far, 30 people so far. Fabulous, we'll give you all a moment. So where do you think reporting guidelines will help you with your writing? We'll give the last folks a couple of extra minutes. It looks like um, there's at least 30 people going for every single option, which is great. Okay, let's end the poll so you can all see the results. It looks like everybody is sharing those results. So you should all hopefully be able to see those results where it's looking like um, all of those options are going to be useful to someone. And the one that's winning at the moment, just, just, just is preparing journal submissions and straight after that outline papers, then revising paper drafts and then planning research. So thank you all for sharing. Okay. There's another place that reporting guidelines can be very helpful and that's in peer review. So the reporting guidelines can't help you judge whether a study made a sensible decision, but they can help you figure out if you've been given enough information to make a judgment. So step one is to check whether the manuscript actually cites a reporting guideline and read through that abstract and see, do you agree with their choice of guideline? And if not, or if they haven't actually used one, choose an appropriate reporting guideline. We'll cover how to do that in a bit. And then just compare that manuscript to the guideline to see whether every item has either been reported or is clearly not applicable to this particular study design. So it's a useful way just to check, do you have enough information to proceed with peer review, really? And if you're missing most of the information, you might say, well, is it worth going any further? So let's put this into practice. Let's have a play. So I've grabbed an, a random abstract from BMC Public Health, um, and I've identified strobe as a good match for this paper. So it's the association between dog walking, physical activity, and owner's perception of safety, a cross-sectional evidence from the US and Australia. So let's have a play with this. So strobe has a short version just for abstracts, and it asks for the study design to be described and for a clear objective to be stated. So let's have a look at this abstract. Did they tell us the study design and did they tell us their objective? So the background, I've already read you the title. The background says, we examined the relationship between dog walking and physical activity within and between four US city, cities and Australia and investigated if dog walking is associated with higher perceived safety in US and Australian cities. So, do you feel like they've done the two things Strobe asked for? Have they told you the study design? And are you clear what the objective of the study is? And if not, what more would you like? Um, so we've got somebody saying not enough. What more would you like? 
Um, self oh, so is it self-reported physical activity or is it objectively measured physical activity? Okay, um, we need more for the study design. Yeah, they haven't clearly stated the study design. We do have it in the title. We've got cross-sectional. Oh, we, do we think that's enough? Would we like a little bit more? Maybe we'd like a little bit more. So we've got that the objective explained well. Yeah, I agree with that. They kind of told us what we're going to be reading about. So we've got someone saying, thinking it's clear. Yeah, uh, thinking it's complete. If we looked at what Strobe was asking for, Strobe doesn't ask for very much for the background. I think sometimes we think background's really important and actually Strobe's just tell us the objective, make sure the study design's clear. We've got a bit of information there, probably all right. Let's have a look at the methods. And this time, I'm not gonna show you strobe to start with. I'm just gonna show you the methods, have a think, and then we'll use strobe to see whether strobe helps. So here's the methods. Dog owners, N equals um, 1,113. In the pet connection study, completed a cross-sectional survey. Data were collected across four study sites, three in the US, San Diego, Nashville, and Portland, and a fourth in Australia, Perth. Physical activity, local walking, dog walking, and individual and community perceptions of safety were analyzed for dog walkers and non-dog walkers for each study site. Between city comparisons were examined for dog walkers. What do we think about this methods? So I'm not giving you strobe yet, just your, if you were peer reviewing this as an abstract, how would you, what would you be asking? What would you be asking for? Happy with this, not happy with it? So we've got someone saying how many non-dog walkers? Uh, we've got somebody saying two groups. I'm not sure, you may be going to clarify a little bit. Are you saying, uh, are you asking, are there two groups? Um, we've got uh, someone asking number in each study site. Uh, how long did they collect the data for? Yeah, good questions. Um, what is the pet connection study? They are receiving a little bit of knowledge here, yes. Inclusion slash exclusion criteria, yeah. So folks are identifying a few things you'd like. Um, at what points did they complete the survey? Um, it is on dog walking, but then they say physical activity. So it's an assumption that the physical activity is walking, but that's not clear. Yeah. Who analyzed it? Who? Uh, which, excuse me. <coughs> um, which comparison statistics or methods? <coughs> We've got somebody asking, would statistics go in this section? So this is the entire methods. This is the entire methods. So let's have a look at what Strobe actually says. Oh, demographics of the dog owners, yeah. So Strobe says for your methods, you want a description of the setting, follow-up dates or dates at which the outcome events occurred or at which the outcomes were present, as well as any points or ranges on any other timescales for the outcomes. So that's the setting. It wants to know about the participants. So for cross-sectional, the eligibility criteria and the major sources and methods of selections for the participants. And then variables clearly define the primary outcome and then give the statistical methods, including those used to control for confounding. So for those of you who were maybe struggling a little bit, or those of you who were thinking of lots of things, is there anything here that you hadn't thought of that maybe you now think is missing? If we go back to our methods, is there anything from those strobe items? So yeah, follow-up methods and duration, confounders not mentioned, Eligibility criteria for participants, except for having a dog. Yep, primary outcome. So we're getting a little bit more things that we maybe weren't happy with from before. Dates is maybe missing. So I think there's a little bit of detail here that we would have liked to see. And hopefully Strobe has helped a little bit with identifying some of those things. But you've identified a lot of those even without Strobe, which is fantastic. Um, so primary outcome, main aim of the analysis and confounding, yeah. So let's look at the results now. So Strobe for Abstracts asks for participants. And now it's interesting, a lot of you are saying, oh, numbers. So methods and results. Methods tends to be the things that we knew before the study was done. And results is things that we know after the study was done. So things like how many people I managed to recruit is very often a result rather than a method because we don't know how many we're going to manage to recruit before we do the study, but it can depend on your type of study. So with results, we've got participants the number of participants at the beginning and end of the study were asked about. So how many did they recruit versus how many did they get actual data from? Um, the main results, estimates of associations, and if re um, uh, relevant, consider translating estimates of relative risk into absolute risk for a meaningful time period. 
report appropriate measures of variability and uncertainty, e.g. odds ratios with confidence intervals. So that's what we want for our main results. And we'll look at conclusions in a minute. Um, so those are the things that we were asked for in results. So let's have a look. I've split the results into two because it's two paragraphs. It's a bit much for slides. So the first section is talking about how often these people walked. So across all study sites, dog walkers walked with their dog five to six times per week for a total of 93 to 109 minutes per week and achieved more than or equal to 30 minutes of physical activity on more days per week and walked in their neighborhood more often per week compared with non-dog walkers, all p-values less than 0.01. Compared with Perth, significantly fewer dog walkers walked in their local park in the three US study sites and San Diego dog walkers walked more often in their neighborhoods per week compared with Perth dog walkers. And again, all p-values less than or equal to 0.05. What do we think about this? Thinking about Strobe, what Strobe asked us for earlier and what we generally know. So participant numbers are missing, yep. They gave us in the methods, um, the number of people that filled in that survey, but yes, we don't know the number of people that were analyzed and we don't know how many in each city. Um, distance walked is not reported. Yeah, maybe we'd be interested in that. Few estimates and confidence intervals and too many p-values. Yeah, would we maybe have liked the numbers for those things more than just a more than less than p-value? Um, how long was the study? So that would have been in methods, definitely. That how long was the study was a methods question, definitely. So just thinking in terms of those sort of results that the things that Strobe was asking us about, they haven't really told us things like how many people they sent the survey to, um, the response rate, and that wasn't in the methods either. Um, it would have been good to know how many people in each city. Um, and we've just got the p-values. Maybe we would have preferred to see the actual numbers um, rather, um, and, then, and then be able to compare those numbers ourselves, which sort of fits what Strobe, with what Strobe was asking for. Um, so in terms of how did they design or validate the study, that would not be uh, an abstract level thing. That's quite a lot of detail for an abstract. Um, although if you could fit it in, it's quite nice. So here's part two of those results. So in Portland, dog walkers perceived significantly more neighborhood problems. And in Nashville, dog walkers perceived a significantly higher level of neighborhood natural surveillance, i.e. eyes on the street, compared with non-dog dog walkers, both p-value less than 0.05 among dog walkers, Females were more likely than males to feel safer walking with their dog in their neighborhood, and they give us odds ratios and confidence intervals. Compared with dog walkers in Perth, dog walkers from each uh, of the US city sites, study sites felt safer in their neighborhood and perceived there was more neighborhood surveillance, all p-values less than 0.001. Is this changing anything about what we were thinking? They added anything else? We've again got the p-values. We do have one set of odds ratios and confidence intervals. Um, variables adjusted for in the models. To be honest, we don't know anything about the models and if they even did any modeling because we didn't know about the methods. The stats analysis was missing in the methods and that's a really important bit. So that linked into Strobe saying, tell us about your statistical analysis. So good spot. So hopefully Strobe was a little bit helpful in us identifying that maybe it would have been nice to see a bit more actual data as opposed to just the more or less than. And then if we look at what Strobe says about conclusions, so conclusion just said that we wanted a general interpretation of the results, and they've given us this paragraph. And we'll look at it just for interest sake. So this multi-site international study provides further support for the potential for dog walking to increase levels of physical activity. Walking with a dog may be a mechanism for increasing perceptions of neighborhood safety and getting to know the neighborhood. However, significant between country differences exist. Further international research is required to understand the drivers for these between country differences. Community-based programs and policies aimed at improving safety and social connectedness should consider the wider community benefits of dog walking and include strategies for supporting more dog walking. Is this a general interpretation of the results? As per Strobe, that's all Strobe asks for in a conclusion. So we've got somebody saying maybe it's too elaborated. Hmm, interesting point. Not really because it's making recommendations for future research. So it's going beyond just a general interpretation. And it's sometimes nice to see a recommendations for further research in a conclusion section, particularly when it's making clear how generalizable those results are, or what they can be used for, so that people don't take them in the wrong way. 
But what do we think about the balance of words here? Thinking about that reporting guideline. So some recommendations may go beyond the study results. Yeah, very possible. Um, too lengthy, it seems it's half as long as the results. Yeah. So I think this is sometimes where the reporting guideline can be quite helpful as well. Uh, because sometimes as peer reviewers, we go, oh, there's a, there's a word limit, there's a word count. And I'm asking them to add so much extra detail in. And the reporting guideline can sort of give us that sense of stability of, ah, but there's only one line on conclusions in the strobe for abstracts. And there's a lot more information in methods and results. It is fair for me to ask them to move some of those words away from conclusions and into methods and results to fill in what the information that people really do need. Um, and there's some overclaims going in, in my opinion, uh, e.g. direction of effect is assumed. Okay, yes. So dog walking increases perceptions of safety, but higher perceptions of safety could equally increase dog walking. Yep, so the way they've interpreted, maybe you're not comfortable with, um, and that's okay. So yeah, hopefully that has been an interesting exercise. How did you feel about using strobe for abstracts as your way of approaching that abstract? Because that will have probably been in a field of study that is not people's specialty. It is a bit of one that I picked because it is um, not too technical, but also likely not to match everybody's specialty. What did we think? Was it helpful? Was it not helpful? If it wasn't helpful, why? If it was helpful, why? So we've got a helpful, fantastic. Helpful because without a guide, you tend to forget about some important things, yeah. Helpful, it's useful to think about the detail required for the majority of readers to get meaningful information from the abstract, yeah. Uh, very helpful as a way of spotting what's missing and also what may not be needed. Um, helpful to guide the reading. Um, when participating in peer review, apart from following reporting guidelines, should we also comment on more technical or field specific stuff? Definitely, definitely. Um, the reporting guideline can just be a really helpful starting point, but it's definitely not going to be enough for your peer review. Um, very helpful, provide items to be reported very clearly and also for the reader. Yeah, it's helpful to standardize. Yep. So yes, the reporting guideline in the same way as your reporting guideline is not enough for planning your study, but it's a useful aid. The reporting guideline is not enough for your peer review. You will know about that field. You will have technical knowledge when you do peer review, but it is a helpful thing to start with. And sometimes folks particularly the first few times you do peer review, it can be really helpful to be able to say, it's not just me saying to you, author, that you need these things. There is, there is some guidance that agrees with me. And it can be quite helpful to be able to say, if you look at this, it's not just me making it up. Somebody else has said this first. Yeah. Um, then we've got a question. It's helpful, but I feel there may, are many different use cases that may arise. Is there a repository of all guidelines available? I'm going to answer that question in just a minute. Um, we've got other options apart from strobe. Going to answer that question in just a minute. And I can see Patricia, my colleague, has popped a link into the Equator Network. Fantastic. So your questions are leading me straight into how the heck do you pick an appropriate reporting guideline for your study, whether it's your own or somebody else's? So how do we do this? Step one, to choose an appropriate reporting guideline, you need to know what kind of research you've done or the kind of research you're planning to do. You don't have to get super, super technical. Um, but there's a few things we can think about. So there's some people who will know I am doing a clinical trial. I am writing up a case report of a single thing I've done. I am building a prediction model. And for those people, if you have a, like a couple of word description of your study design, that's great. That's all you need. If you're kind of struggling to categorize your research, you can think through a few questions. So thing one, what or who are you working with? Are you working with people? Are you working with animals? Are you working with bacteria, viruses? What is your thing? What is your people's? Then what is the raw material of your study? Are you working with um, raw data that's collected either by yourself or someone else, and then you're doing primary research? Or are you doing secondary research? So you're using published journal articles as your material. So you're synthesizing the results, secondary research. So am I doing primary or secondary? Then what is your research team's role in relation to the data? So if your team doesn't interfere at all and they instead are watching to see what happens in an existing situation, then you're doing observational work. So in a clinical professional setting, that could be a clinical professional is controlling something, um, say which treatment a patient receives, um, but their decisions are not driven by your research project any at all. You're watching what happens. 
if your team controls anything, then you're doing experimental work. So if you're giving an exposure or choosing who gets a treatment or anything like that, then um, or based on whatever rules that you've set, then you're doing experimental work. If you are hands-on changing something. So if your hands touch anything, then it's experimental work. If you're doing experimental work, it's helpful to know how the research team has decided who gets what. So say if you're doing sort of more clinical work, which participant gets a particular treatment? How are you deciding that? Um, you might be doing it in a non-random method. So every patient in your clinic gets one treatment. Every patient in your collaborator's clinic gets another one. Or you might be using a random method like rolling a dice or using a randomization service. And then what data are you collecting? Are you collecting numbers? So quantitative data, data or are you working with qualitative data, so anything else like opinions or feelings. So these are just some ways to describe your research. Your field, you might need to go into a different level of detail, um, but this is a good start point for choosing that reporting guideline. So once you've broadly categorized your research, we can go and look at our target journal. So it's a really good idea to choose the target journal before starting to write, and this is one of the reasons why. Your target journal's instructions for authors often say something about particular study designs. So they might say, if you are doing a clinical trial, use the consort reporting guideline. And it's a good idea to check these requirements, even if you've published with a journal before, as they're often updated as new reporting guidelines are released. So based on what you know so far, between your target journal and what you know about your study, you can now choose a general reporting guideline for your piece of work. So it might just be the one that the journal has suggested. If the journal hasn't suggested anything, or you think actually the journal is suggesting things that don't match my study design, your next port of call could be the equator network. So we list um, all the general reporting guidelines for the major study designs on our homepage. And we've also then got a database, a library of all of the reporting guidelines for human research that you can search through. So for instance, if you're doing a randomized primary experimental research with people, you're probably doing a trial and you're going to use consort. That's the reporting guideline. If you're doing observational primary research, then strobe is helpful for case controls, cohorts, and cross-sectional studies. If you're doing secondary research of these primary studies, you can use Prisma if you're doing experimental. If you're collecting qualitative data, instead of quantitative data with these three options, you could use SRQR, uh, SRQR alongside or instead of consult and strobe for primary research, and you can use NTREC for secondary research. So these are just some of the options. And if you're doing research with animals, the big reporting guideline is ARRIVE. ARRIVE is designed for reporting in vivo experiments. So it's focused on preclinical research using an experimental process. Some of its items, therefore, won't be appropriate for all study designs, but it's usually a good idea to check ARRIVE if you're doing any kind of animal research to see if it will help maybe alongside the reported guideline you're using. So for instance, let's go back to STROBE. If I look at main STROBE, STROBE item 14 asks for participant characteristics such as demographic, clinical and social characteristics, and information on exposures and potential confounders. This is sensible in both human and animal research, but arrives item eight goes a little bit deeper and it asks for species appropriate details of the animals used. And then item eight B goes even more into even more detail. It looks for information that's crucial for readers to judge how generalizable your work is. So depending on what you're doing, it can be helpful to use these different guidelines. And if you're doing observational research, some of ARRIVE's items just might not be appropriate at all. So for instance, item 4A of ARRIVE asks you to state whether randomization was used to allocate your experimental units. If you've already stated you're using a retrospective study design using routinely collected data for information, well then you don't need to do that. So it's going to be a case of needing to use a little bit of common sense when using these different reporting guidelines together. So all of the big study designs are in a table on our homepage as an easy way to find them. And they're great, these big general reporting guidelines, but sometimes there's an extension or a more specific guideline that can be more helpful. So there are extensions 
which extend a general reporting guideline for a particular study design or clinical area. And then there's more specific guidelines that weren't developed in conjunction with those general reporting guidelines, but they function similarly. And these all cover the entire paper, but they're more specific than just all clinical trials. So for instance, there's a consort extension for pilot trials, for trials that use artificial intelligence, and for trials in specific areas like orthodontics. Um, there are strobe extensions for if you're using routinely collected data or if you're working in infectious diseases. There are Prisma extensions for if you're working, if you're looking at your search or if you're doing a scoping review, for instance. So particular types of, of designs, so sub-designs, and also in particular areas. And as I say, it's not just the extensions of these big reporting guidelines. There's also um, community-specific, so field-specific uh, designs and um, reporting guidelines that have been set up. And all of these are in our database. So here's an example of why that might be useful. Item 14 from Strobe again. So we want the characteristics of the study participants and information on exposures and potential confounders. If I was working in infectious diseases, do you think this is enough if I'm talking about study participants? What might I also want to say about study participants beyond just infectious, beyond just what's here for an infectious disease? So comorbidities, yep. Uh, vaccination status, yeah. And who's the other, what, well, what's the other component in an infectious disease study? I'm working with people, but I'm also working with the disease itself, the pathogen, yes, the bug. So strobe doesn't go far enough because it doesn't know about the bug. So strobe um, ID actually takes us that little bit further. It asks for information by strain type, if appropriate, and then uses of standardized nomenclature. And it goes into a little bit more detail there. And these are things where you might be saying, oh, well, I, of course I would know that. If I'm working in infectious diseases, of course I'd know to report my bug, of course. And it's just one of these things of it's helpful to have everything. This one might be obvious. That's why it's a good one for us to chat about because we're not all infectious disease experts. But when we get into the nitty gritty, it can be really helpful to have all of these things in one place for us to look at. And you can search for these extensions in our database by using the study design search or by clicking on the extensions button for your general study design. Um, so the, the Equator website has lots of reporting guidelines and the search is clinical areas focus on human medicine. If you're working in animal research, um, the Meridian database is very helpful. It's just got animal research reporting guidelines, if that applies to you. Um, the list of guidelines is a lot shorter. It's a lot easier to navigate, but they don't have all of the general reporting guidelines. So it's usually a good idea to use alongside Equator. Um, so yeah, for in, in vitro research, Arrive is a really good one to start with for animal re in vitro research. Um, for those of you in psychology, the JARS reporting guideline set from APA has a series of reporting guidelines for all kinds of research designs collecting qualitative, quantitative, and mixed data. For those in psychology, this might be a really good place to look as well. Um, when you're using an extension, they generally repeat the information from the main guideline in their checklist so that you don't have to use the main guideline and the extension. You could just use the extension. But sometimes you end up needing more than one reporting guideline. There are some useful extra reporting guidelines that focus on specific elements. So those general extensions are for the whole article, and these are for specific elements like the abstracts. So strobe for abstracts fits in here. And again, you can find them in our database using the section of report search or the free text search. Um, and just some useful ones that you might like are tidier for interventions. If you're working on an intervention, they can be helpful. Sample for statistics, cherries for online surveys, and then console for abstracts, strobe for abstracts, and there's a bunch more specifically for abstracts. Very helpful if you're writing a conference abstract, for instance. But again, the general reporting guidelines are enough. For those of you who are doing more laboratory-based res based research, and I'm seeing a couple of questions about that, um, our database isn't as useful for this. And to be honest, it can be quite tricky to find all of those, but you will find that a lot of the journals have now got more general checklists to cover some of the more laboratory cell-based research. So to do a, sort of a questions and things, we've come to the end of the bit where I talk and we chat together, and we're going to move into um, our panel chat portion of this session. So this is a chance to discuss any element of reporting guidelines and their development that you're curious about. So I'm going to invite my colleagues to join us on camera. 
Um, and that is Gary Collins, who is a medical statistician, the director of the UK Equator Center, and one of the founders of the Tripod Reporting Guideline for Prediction Model Development and Evaluation. Um, and he's also been involved in developing numerous other reporting guidelines. Shona Kirtley is an information specialist. As Equator's Knowledge and Information Manager, she manages our library of reporting guidelines and registry of guidelines under development. And she's also a developer of Prisma Search. Patricia Lugulo is a meta researcher at the UK Equator Center and a member of several reporting guideline development groups. And in her previous role as a medical writer, she advised clients on using reporting guidelines. And Michael Schlissel is a medical statistician who is leading a project to audit all of the reporting guidelines in the Equator database and is leading the development of a suite of reporting guideline extensions and applications for nutrition research. So I'm going to close my chat slides so that we can have a chat with everyone. So this is your chance to ask any questions and effectively I'm going to facilitate a bit of a panel chat. So this is your chance to pop any questions about reporting guidelines, their development, their use, anything like that into the chat. And I think while we're waiting for people to write in some questions, I'm going to sort of kick things off with a general question to the group, which is, um, this is a UKRN, Reproducibility Network webinar. How does reporting fit into reproducibility? If, I, if I'm putting my code and my protocol on the Open Science Framework, do I still need a reporting guideline? Surely I'm sorted for reporting, reproducibility. I'll jump in there, Jen, obviously. Um, so this, this is a common thing, and I see it on Twitter, and, and somebody will say, well, yeah, I've, I've made my code available, got my markdown, whatever, that's all I need. One has to think, you know, research articles, number one, have different consumers. It's not just the clinician, it's not just the statistician involved, it's not just the methodologist, it's not just the, the lab scientist, it's patients as well. And we all will take different bits from a research article. So a clinician or a general um, Joe clinician is not going to understand your R code and understand what you've done. So that's one thing. There's also all the stuff leading up to getting a hold of your data set. So your code is all about reproducing your analyses. So you've got the data set, you click a few buttons and you're reproducing your p-values, your effect estimates, blah, blah, blah. But actually there's a whole process leading up to, to getting that data set. And, and as you do any study, like a clinical trial, there are decisions along the way. And one has to document those decisions um, so readers can actually understand the process, how you've got to get your got to your data set, for example. Um, so yeah, in my view, you can't have reproducibility without reporting. And there is also the motivation for the study. There is not uh, anything about that in your code. Why you started? Uh, what led you to start the study in the first place? Why is it needed? I think. And also from an information specialist point of view, um, the reporting the literature search very fully and clearly is crucial to being able to reproduce uh, the literature search and the results for systematic reviews. So the reporting is absolutely crucial in that respect for reproducibility. Fantastic, thanks everyone. Um, so we have a question. I have struggled to apply some of the reporting, gui reporting guidelines. So for example, a case series has no clear reporting guideline. There's just an article from an ophthalmologist. I ended up using the CARE criteria. So CARE is the reporting guideline for case reports. Um, I ended up using the CARE criteria for a small case series but a lot of the information was not applicable. Will journals take a negative view of this? And I think more generally, maybe you want to speak to um, the existence of a reporting guideline for case series if you wanted to in general too. The case series is pretty much a cohort study that was not most times really well planned in advance. So Strobe would probably be a good uh, go-to resource to, to answer that. But the question is really about uh, the journals, and that depends, uh, because um, many journals do simply not care about uh, the reporting guidelines. So I think it's more about what you are actually aiming to, to achieve with your, with your report. Uh, to please the journal, to, to inform the readers. And I would say it doesn't matter unless, and as far as I know, this is not the case for any journal, unless the journal strictly 
uh, ask you not to follow a reporting guideline, there is no reason for you not to, to try and make uh, use of them. I think let's, let's flip that one to the other side, which is what happens when a journal says you must use a reporting guideline and they want you to hand in a checklist, but there isn't one for your study design. And that's, that's a common thing. So folks who've, who've looked for a reporting guideline and said there isn't one for what I'm doing, that can happen. What are you supposed to do then? I think Shona okay. maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a question we very often receive, actually, you know, as an inquiry. Um, and the best thing you can do really there is be um, open with the journal and say that there isn't actually a specific reporting guideline that, that actually matches your study. Um, and then try to have a discussion with them around whether a close closely sort of matching guideline might be the best way to to go forward and 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 fill out a guideline that that closely matches your study um, and submit that with your um, submission um, and include alongside that an explanation for the journal and, and have a discussion with them about it and hopefully you know they will understand then that, that, that there isn't a guideline that matches your study and, and you've done your best to report and clearly and and, and include a guideline with your submission. Thank you. Patricia, you were going to say something as well. I was going to say the same thing. Just upload the, the <laughs> uh, what you can use, like two, three reporting guidelines, and use the non-applicable uh, uh, choice. So you can say, this is not applicable to my study design. And if the, the editor wants to discuss with you, have a talk. Why not? I think that's a really good point, this idea of not applicable. Um, that the reporting guidelines are not supposed to be we can such a straight jacket of, of guidance. It is not supposed to be that. If something doesn't apply to your study, say so, leave it out. Um, I will say sometimes people say not applicable when actually it's something that deserves a line in their article explaining why that's not something that was applicable because it's a standard part of the study design they're using. So if it is a study design that matches your study really well, but it was not applicable in your circumstances, that's maybe something to discuss. Um, things like blinding comes to mind. Like blinding wasn't applicable in our instance because it's impossible to blind because of the kind of thing we're doing. Actually state that in the article because it's such an important part of your study design. But when you are in the situation where there isn't a great match between your study design and any reporting guideline, there the not applicable is much more, you can put it just in the reporting guideline. It doesn't matter so much. So those are two ways to think about that. So thank you for that question. Um, we have another question. I am teaching how to do healthcare research to very junior health students. Do you have any ideas to enhance the use of reporting guidelines from the very early protocol design? I have the idea that as early as possible is much better. Who'd like to take that one? Can I? Go for it. So as Jen said, reporting guidelines are reporting guidelines. They were not supposed to be used to plan, but when you use them and you start using, as, using them as early as possible, you have two results. First, you prevent things later. You prevent, to forget, to prevent yourself to forgetting things later. And second, you uh, grow a culture in your group about using reporting guidelines. So the more these junior uh, researchers get used to the language, the structure of the reporting guidelines and how to use them, the better, because they, were going, they are going to plan better, uh, write better, publish better, and more complete uh, reports. So kudos to you to start using that as early as possible. Yeah. And I think something to mention is um, using not just reporting guidelines at planning stage. There is fantastic methodology guidance out there. And what's really nice is the reporting guidelines is sometimes the reporting guideline makes you think about something that you didn't know in that study design. And you go, oh, they're asking me about X. I need to know more about that. And that leads you to the methodology guidance, which is a really nice thing. Um, but yeah, there's great methodology guidance out there. You really want to be encouraging your juniors to be using that. Um, when they plan their research as well. Michael, you had a comment. 
Yeah, I was going to mention, uh, you already mentioned during the presentation, but I think that one uh, good way of trying to motivate early career researchers to use reporting guidelines is introducing uh, the explanation and elaboration papers because they bring the examples of uh, good reporting for all of the aspects of a, a specific study design or a specific medical specialty. And these junior researchers, these early career researchers, uh, they might get, they might just find themselves a bit lost on, on how to start uh, describing things or, or, or even how to do things. And these examples are, are very useful in, in, in both ways. Uh, Patricia said it's not meant to, to help you plan research, but when you know what you're going to have to report in the end, you are more likely to think about it up front. That's a very good point, Michael. And I think that um, ENEs, the explanation and elaboration papers, are even more important than the checklists because uh, when you read an ELE, all the checklist items are there. So you don't need the checklist anymore. It's there. And second, uh, you have the explanation, the why part of it. Why is that important? And that's very important for you to teach your young researchers as early as possible. So not only report this, but why is it important to, to report this item? Yeah, definitely. I will say some of the E&E &E documents are really long. So um, when you are giving it to a junior researcher, maybe make clear to them that they're not expected to read it from cover to cover. I think Strobe's nearly 100 pages. Um, so yeah, they're not expected to read it cover to cover. It's a thing to dip in and out of for good examples when they need it. But it is an incredibly useful document. Any other comments on that? Um, I, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that there are reporting guidelines for writing protocols. Um, so that's another really helpful, they're reporting guidelines, but because they're for writing protocols, they sometimes they sort of bridge the gap between reporting guidance and methodology guidance a little bit. But yeah, there's a lot of the big study designs have now got a reporting guideline for the protocol as well as for the results paper. So that's another really helpful one for your, your junior researchers. So thank you for that question. Um, Next question is, so for my research, which is prediction modeling, there are reporting guidelines, which include some advice on analysis methods, but also separate groups of academics are developing methods guides. I have a general interest question about the interplay between these two things, especially if the methods recommendations end up differing slightly in these publications. I wondered how much you think reporting guidelines should delve into statistical methods recommendations or whether they should be separate publications, which should be updated based on the other if they differ. Gary, I wonder if you want to take this one to start with. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not sure exactly what reporting guideline you're referring to. So I, I assume it's a, one is the tripod reporting guideline, so which I know quite well because I was a lead author on. So um, in our explanation and elaboration document, which accompanies the, the tripod statement, we, um, so let's say, the focus is on reporting. So that's the reported guideline is primarily focused on reporting. But when we developed that particular reporting guideline, um, we had done lots of systematic reviews, we'd seen lots of papers that there were also lots of bad statistical practices in the primary studies. So we took the opportunity within the tripod an explanation and elaboration document to highlight um, some methodological issues and provide some references um, to help authors, because people use the E&E document as a planning document as well. Um, so it's, it's to highlight some issues of not what to do and what to do, because there are implications of reporting as well. So there's, there's an issue around in, in prediction models called calibration, for example, which is looking at the accuracy of predictions. We knew that this was rarely, rarely, rarely done so we're trying to tell us that actually you should do this and also then, and report it. So there's an implication of actually doing something, a conduct issue, and then reporting it. Um, and the second point is, is when there's conflict between methods guidance and reporting recommendations, usually reporting recommendations um, won't I would always defer to the report, reporting guideline first, I think, as being correct, because particularly in the world of prediction modeling, it's a, it's a, light, 
it's the wild west out there. So there are lots of methods guidance in that in this field that aren't correct. Um, reporting guidelines do get updated. So if, if methodology has changed, um, reporting guidelines will periodically. So the consult statement has been updated once, I think maybe it's twice. Prism has been updated once or twice. Star has been updated once or twice. Tripod is currently undergoing an update and an adaptation for machine learning. And any new methodological guidance that has been um, derived over the last six, seven years will be reflected in the, in the new reporting guideline. Um, I'm not sure I've answered the question there, but I've rambled on for five minutes. That's okay. We've got a, a reply, which is that Tripod has been very helpful. Thank you. I was just interested that there's more detail in Tripod on stats methods than in other guidelines. Yeah, I think that that is just because the, the um, doing a prediction model study, there's lots of different sorts of stats methods involved in doing that type of study. If you do the clinical trial, the statistical methods are pretty brief and standard. There's nothing controversial in there. But actually, when you do a, a prediction model, you've got to miss some data, you've got to handle continuous covariates, you've got to do some validation, blah, blah, blah. There's lots of different stats that come into play when you develop a model. So there's lots of um, issues around guidance on how best to do that and how best to report that. But I'm glad you find it useful. So thank you for that question. There, there is a sort of an, an issue in reporting guideline development, which is how much should the reporting guideline be methods neutral? Um, this idea that we don't want the reporting guideline to make it impossible for somebody to report their study if they haven't done gold standard methodology, because the purpose of the reporting guideline is from a reproducibility perspective, transparency perspective, to get everything out there. So even if you haven't done the best possible thing, and I'm putting that in giant bunny rabbit ears, because sometimes there isn't the best possible thing, right? We do the best we can in the circumstances. Um, we still want to hear about it so that people can judge the work and understand how, how generalizable that work is, how much they can trust that work. They need to know everything. So that is a tension for reporting guideline developers, because there is this, this temptation that to, to give people as much guidance as possible, but also to have the reporting guideline set up in such a way that everybody feels they can report their work. Um, I don't know if anyone else, Patricia, yeah. Yeah, this is why I think the um, newest reporting guidelines are more and more adopting language like justify. If you didn't do something, justify, that's okay, but just say why not. Why not you did, uh, why you didn't blind, why you didn't calibrate, why you didn't um, increase your sample, whatever. If you just justify, it's reported. And the, the person reading, reading your, your paper can understand what you did and why. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that before we move on? I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm driving way too much away from the question, but uh, one, one last piece of advice on, on identifying which uh, would be the best method, the one in the reporting guideline or the one in the, the general methodological uh, guidance is to ask a statistician. So that, that is advice coming straight to you from a medical statistician, ask a statistician. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Um, so we've got next question. Uh, how, and I think this is, a, this is an interesting one for, um, for all of us, which is how are reporting guidelines approved by the equator group? I have noticed an increasing number of new reporting guidelines, usually just slightly modified versions of existing ones and discipline specific elaboration and explanation papers that to me at least don't seem necessary and more look more like a method to drive up citations and impact factor. So that's a really interesting question. Who'd like to start off on that one? Yeah, I'm happy to, <laughs> to um, start. Um, specifically with the discipline specific, um, there's definitely been um, an increase, absolutely. Um, and I think we often hear that that's because it, it's mainly to fuel the uptake um, of reporting guidelines because people perhaps feel that the more general main reporting guidelines aren't quite specific enough for individual fields and disciplines. 
Um, and so what we've been hearing is that the development of, of the more discipline specific ones, although they're very similar to the main guidelines like consult and strobe, um, are being developed purely to make it easier for people um, to use reporting guidelines in those particular uh, disciplines. Um, you know, we don't we don't know if that's the case, obviously, but that's sort of the general uh, um, understanding of, of why these uh, these reporting guidelines are being uh, developed in greater numbers. Yeah, we refer to these as as application papers sometimes, where somebody takes a reporting guideline and just shows how it applies in their area, and they can be really helpful for some folks. Um, in terms of, sorry, Gary, yes. Well, I was just going to say, so I just want to make a, a, a statement because it's a misconception. So we don't approve or endorse any single guideline as 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 of today. We never have done. Um, th that may change in, in the future. But at the moment, we have always adopted a very inclusive approach that if authors have made some attempt to provide guidance to, sorry, if, if if guideline developers have made some attempt to provide some guidance for authors on reporting, we've included it in, in our library. But being in our library does not mean we endorse or approve that reporting guideline. Uh, we've just completed a, um, a very large audit of our library of 400 odd reporting guidelines. Um, and, and some of the guidelines in there now will be removed because they're not proper guidelines. And in the future, we, we may be um, deriving um, some kind of approval system to say this is this has gone through the various steps that we um, approve of in terms of developing a reporting guideline. They've gone through a consensus based process. So it's not the guys down the pub on the back of an envelope thinking of things that authors report. They've actually gone through a consensus based process with key experts around the world. Blah, 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 to derive some evidence-based recommendations reported. But just, just to say we don't approve or endorse anything as of today. So yeah, I think that's a really important point. When you see a journal say, you must use equator network reporting guidelines, there is no such thing as an equator network reporting guideline. The equator network is a space for all of the reporting guidelines to be collected together in one space. And Shona does a huge amount of work on that, keeping track of the literature and finding them all. Um, but how they get into there, there's no, there's no like quality assessment or anything, as Gary says, as yet. So there's no such thing as an equate network reporting guideline. That said, there are um, a number of people affiliated with the equate network through our centers, and those people have been involved in the development of a lot of reporting guidelines. So I think that's where some of the, 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 the fuzziness can come in, is that you'll see a lot of the same names cropping up, and that's people who have been involved in a lot of the development of reporting guidelines and are affiliated with Equator, but it still doesn't make the reporting guideline an Equator network reporting guideline. Those don't exist as yet. Yes, I'd like to add, uh, there are more than 100 reporting guidelines under development at the moment. We have a list of them in our website and we do uh, recommend that developers use uh, um, certain methods to do that. So there is a toolkit for the development, development of reporting guidelines uh, that you can say it is Equator <laughs> Development Toolkit. And we recommend that those interested in developing something in their field, in their discipline, do uh, get to know and use them. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So you might have seen reporting guidelines under development. You might have seen us um, saying, I'll say on social media, please, if you are developing a reporting guideline, register it with us. That's not an approval process, but what that is, is a way for us to keep track of the reporting guidelines. And it's also a really helpful space so that if somebody is thinking about developing a reporting guideline, they can come and see first, is somebody developing it already? And we can prevent a little bit of that duplication of effort. So I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. So I think just because of, oh, we, we, because of who we've got here, um, the question about how do you decide then when a new reporting guideline is needed? Because we have people in this room, everybody, everybody on the panel here has been involved in reporting guideline development and is involved in some develop, guiding development at the mm -hmm. moment. So how, how do we go about deciding that a new guideline is actually needed? I think this 
kind of goes with with the previous question. Uh, I didn't want to, to extend too much because I didn't know how many questions there were still to answer. But one very good way of, of looking at a reporting guideline is assessing whether it was evidence-based or not. So now to answer the question, uh, how to decide whether a, a reporting guideline, a new reporting guideline or an extension to an existing reporting guideline is needed, uh, usually or ideally I would say, you appraise the literature, you see uh, what's out there in that specific uh, field, being the field, a specific type of study design or, or, or a medical specialty, and you check uh, how well studies are reported in this area. Uh, and you can do that, uh, and again, I think Patricia would be better to, to talk a little bit about it, but you can uh, use the reporting guidelines uh, to check whether certain items have been reported or whether there is a, a, a systematic lack of information for a specific uh, item of a reporting guideline, but bearing in mind that reporting guidelines are not necessarily uh, critical appraisal tools or reporting quality uh, checklists. They are a list of items that you should report. And if there is the need for a new reporting guideline to a specific er area, you will probably find a lot of lack of information in that area because perhaps it will need uh, more detailment on, on, the, on the reporting guidelines that are available. So I would say that the first thing is to assess uh, the, the, the existing literature to gather some evidence basis for justifying the need of a new uh, reporting guideline. Does anyone want to add anything to that? Thank you so much, Michael. Well, it should be, it should start evidence-based, right? Is there evidence that something is being reported poorly, poorly in your area? Usually that evidence comes from users of the evidence. So they want to find things in papers and they are not finding them. And that bothers them. And then they say, oh, we need to guide people on how to write about this particular thing. This is usually how the story of the development of a reporting guideline starts. So uh, evidence of uh, bad reporting that you should collect objectively, and then uh, you should gather experts in the area to say what's missing and there are steps the, uh, of development for you to follow about that. Fantastic. I do think one of the things we have been talking about more sort of in Equator is this idea of if somebody says, oh, there's poor reporting in my field, the question is, is there poor reporting in your field because the current guidance doesn't meet the needs of your field? Or is there poor reporting in your field because your field is not using the existing guidance? Because if the field is not using the existing guidance, there is no point in creating more guidance. Step one is getting people to use the existing guidance. And sometimes that's the story of updating existing reporting guidelines too. So sometimes the existing reporting guidelines are not being used or used as much as they should or as well as they should. And, they, and the development uh, developers um, see that and start an update that to fill the gaps in their checklists and EMEs. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, did you wanna to add to that? I was just going to say that then uh, you go for the natural next step. You, you check the, 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 the reporting completeness in, in a specific area, and then you check whether existing reporting guidance would be sufficient uh, and there are many ways of doing this. You can do a, a survey, you can, you can uh, run a, a, a more structured Delphi uh, exercise. Um, and this, and, and now a little bit of personal experience, this is something that I'm really trying to, to wait in my, my project, uh, because at the end of the day, who decides whether a new reporting guideline is needed? Uh, it, it shouldn't be the the, the solely the, the the researchers leading the project, but the community as a whole. So you present them with the lack of uh, 
you present them with the, uh, the failures in reporting completeness, you present them with the existing guidance, and then collectively you decide whether the existing guidance would be sufficient to, to fulfill that, uh, that gap, or whether actually more tailored or extended uh, reporting guidance would be needed because there are specific particularities in that area that are definitely not covered by the existing guidance. Yeah, thank you. Right, I'm not seeing any other questions popping into the chat, so do feel free to throw anything into the chat that you are curious about with reporting guidelines, using reporting guidelines, finding the correct reporting guideline, using it in peer review or in um, anything to do with developing reporting guidelines or indeed just general how reporting guidelines function. Um, Patricia, yeah. yeah. Uh, while people are thinking about new questions, what we could do is to give an example. So Shona is here and she could tell us the story about the development of Prisma Search. So why was Prisma Search developed, Shona? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, well, Prisma Search was developed um, essentially along the same lines as Michael's outline. So we, as uh, professional information specialists, um, we were seeing very, very regularly um, papers being published that just did not provide the detail required for us to assess the literature search, to know what was done um, and what was found by the literature search. Um, even when they and, were following PRISMA, right? Oh yeah, even following PRISMA, because the PRISMA guideline doesn't provide enough details because it's a general uh, guideline on systematic reviews. It doesn't have enough detail in the items related to the literature search um, for people to um, follow that will give them enough information to, to report the literature search fully. And so it was identified that um, a guideline specifically focusing on the literature search was going to be required and that, that that would then be used alongside PRISMA. So the idea is if you're performing a review, you would use the PRISMA guideline for reporting the review and then this additional PRISMA search guideline will be used to report the literature search aspect within the, the review. Um, and so there were a number of studies that have been published showing that literature searches were not being reported um, properly and fully. And it was decided that um, a search related reporting guidelines should be developed. And so a, an international group was formed. Um, and yeah, we, we started to develop the guideline um, with consensus process um, and review um, and it, I mean, I should add, you know, develop, developing a reporting guideline is a very lengthy and very involved um, <laughs> process. So it's not something you can do very quickly. It, it really does take quite a long time to, to develop a robust reporting guideline that really does um, uh, stand up to, to um, you know, use and, and fully reporting. Um, every aspect that's required. But um, yeah, it, the guideline was published in 2021. Um, and, and we have actually, the, the guideline itself, the E&E &E and the guideline are together in one place. So people don't have to um, access two different documents. So we decided to combine them um, into one document um, to make it easier for people. And we've, the examples um, are all combined as well. Um, but, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that, Shona. So we're getting to half past two, um, which I'm aware it's an hour and a half that we've been going. So I think if, there, if, if folks have more questions, we are very happy to keep chatting. I think that's really, it's been a really interesting few questions. We've really much enjoyed them. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I think otherwise, unless anybody has, um, I'm going to ask the rest of the panel, was there anything that you, we wanted to talk about further? Okay, fantastic. I think then let's let's wrap it up at an hour and a half. I think that's a big chunk of your time um, for everybody. We will, as, as always, hang out for a moment longer if you had a question that you didn't want to ask while we're recording. But otherwise, thank you so much for having spent this time with us today. We really appreciate it. If you ever need any help with reporting guidelines, 
you can contact us through our website. So through equator-network.org. Um, and Will's popping in the links for future um, UKRN webinars. Um, but yeah, on behalf of the whole panel, thank you so much for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day further. <laughs>